Okay, hello everyone. Today is Thursday, February 20th, 2014, and this is the week in charts. Let's get the slides up here. I know I say this every week, but this week I do mean it, and you'll see here in just one second. I have a lot to cover, so I'm going to go get a little jacked up on some Mountain Dew. Make some Mountain Dew. Do not compensate me for this endorsement, but hey, PepsiCo. Are you listening? Are you out there? Be happy to endorse your product, or if anybody else has a equally delicious, stop short of saying nutritious. Oh, that's good stuff. oh my goodness! Mm. All right, enough of that nonsense. There's a disclaimer screen. If you've been trading for more than a day, you probably know you can lose money trading. Or as I like to say, all predictions are about the future. A lot of stuff can be ha can happen between now and then. What's a yogiism? Predictions are tough, especially especially those about the future. Um, okay, we're gonna talk about. Oh, before uh, we get into everything, do me a favor, throw me a bone. We had um, some guy reviewed the book and said it's a sound methodology and it works, and talked about how great it was, but then gave me two stars. So I'm like. WTF? Why the face? You know, it's like, what the heck? Um, and I replied to that if you want to check it out on Amazon. But uh, throw me a bone if you like the book. Even if you agree with everyone else, or I should say most everyone else, uh, then put me a review up on Amazon. I appreciate that very much. All right. What are we going to talk about? Well, I want to talk a little bit about overbought, oversold. It's um, the age-old question when it comes to markets, and I'll flesh that out in just one second. Uh, we had another stock hit the... Um, initial profit target and I can't harp on that enough I mean obviously I'm proud and uh, happy that it happened but I think it's something that's really key and um, it's not something that everybody knows which is kind of surprising and, and I don't want to harp on the negative but that's one thing about the the book review the guy's like oh I, I knew everything that was in the book it's like no you don't Danny it's like how would you know everything uh, I've been doing this 20 years, and and I put a lot into that. But um, the point I'm trying to make here is that a lot of people don't realize the importance of scaling out. And what it allows you to do, it allows you to have your cake and eat it too. It allows you to capture that short-term profit. And if the market comes right back in, at least you got something out of the trade. But if the market takes off, it also allows you to participate longer term. And since we never know what the market will do, we're able to take those partial profits and stick with it. I want to talk a little bit about market pruning. We did get stopped out of one, okay? I'm not perfect, okay? Uh, but if you let the market take you out of stinkers and let the market tell you what stocks you should be in, I think you do quite well. Um, as I said last week or possibly the week before, um, uh, had a friend of mine come over. He's a young guy, 21 years old, and he's got a college project. And his college project is to trade stocks and compete with his classmates. And I'm happy to say, and I didn't really, I, I picked a few stocks for him, or I should say together we picked a few stocks starting out a few weeks ago. But since then, he's been on his own. And, and, and what the teacher does with him is tells them on certain days they have to make a trade. So what I told him is, on those days, sell your losers and don't do anything with your winners. And he just went from very low in the rankings all the way up to number two. He's uh, number two behind his teacher. And I have a feeling he's going to win this competition. Um, and that's without help from me. And that's because he's going to let that market prune his portfolio by getting rid of those losing trades when he's forced to trade. Now, obviously, we do things a little bit more... Um, I hate to use the word complex because it's not that much more complex, but we do things in a manner where we have that stop in place and we're not going to sell on any given day or with a time stop like uh, this teacher is effectively doing to them by making them trade. And I think, um, I guess he or she is just forcing them to trade to understand the trading business. But anyway, let the market prune you out of your positions. You get stopped, you get stopped. Now, don't exit a position until you're stopped out. As I've said time and time again, 
I've micromanaged myself out of some big winners in my career. I don't do that anymore, okay? And a lot of other people uh, do that too. And that's, that's one of the most common things I see. So let the market take you out, and I'll show you that in just one second. Uh, anything you want me to talk about, think about it now. If you don't mind, hold off on individual stock picks. I see a couple of stacking up already, but hold off on those. We'll get to them at the end of the presentation. And once you get on those, if you don't mind, ask about one stock at a time. If you put a bunch of stocks with a bunch of commas in between, I'll pick one of those, and then um, I may not get to every one of them. But if you just ask about one stock on one line, I'll talk about it, delete that stock, and then I'll I'm ready to move on to your next stock or somebody else's, whatever the case would be. But uh, one stock per line. Anyway, all right. The age-old question. What is overbought and what is oversold? Well, it depends, okay? Obviously, it depends on the volatility of the market that you're studying. If there's a volatile stock that bounces around 10 20% a day, I mean, some of these little gold stocks that we're in, there's one of them this morning. We'll look at it in one minute. It's up 20 cents. Let's see what that is, round numbers. Yeah, it's like up 4%. That's not that big of a deal. Um, but if you have something that's moving 10% a day, then a 10% sell-off is not oversold, okay? It may just be getting started, okay? Now, Howard says it looks like an oscillator to me. Yes, this is a perfect sine wave, okay? And I'm going to tell you in just one second, settle down, Howard. I'm going to get to it why you shouldn't use overbought and oversold. So it's going to be relative to the market that you're trading, okay? So again, if a stock bounces around 10, 15% a day, then a 10% sell-off is not oversold, or a 10% rally is not overbought. Now, what I did here for illustrative purposes only is I captured a perfect sign wave, and this is an older slide, it's been around forever, but I captured a perfect sign wave off the internet to demonstrate overbought, oversold. Now, in theory, when a market gets down to oversold, it's going to rally all the way back up until it gets overbought, rinse, and repeat in this perfect sine wave manner. But as people often explain, it's sort of like walking the dog, which I just did for a couple of miles. Uh, it goes to one side of the sidewalk and then kind of meanders to the other sidewalk back and forth. But let's say sees a cat or something, every now and then the leash breaks, and this happens, or conversely on the upside, this happens, okay? So trying to sell a market just because it's overbought or trying to buy a market just because it's oversold is a bad idea. It will work until it don't. It will be fairly accurate, and then you're going to blow up doing that sort of thing. Many people have blown up doing this mean reversion type of trading. Now, again, I've got this perfect sine wave, which suggests a perfect statistical um, relationship, but there's not, okay? And, again, you're going to have outliers on both sides of the market, and then sometimes you might just have some chop in between, okay? Now, the other thing to remember is the market is not normally distributed, okay? You, you have a lot more outliers than statistics would suggest. And uh, a lot of people who, who understand statistics might understand the term of fat tail. So markets have fat tails. They don't uh, apply to this nice little distribution type of curve. So if you are measuring overbought, oversold with some sort of oscillator, Howard, <laughs> then you're going to have to be really careful because some oscillators have bound um, parameters, meaning they can only go to zero and they can only go to 100, let's say, okay? So if you're just using that metric, it might be overbought, but it might stay overbought for a long time, or it might jump to overbought even though the underlying security is not overbought. So I think... As usual, and here's no big shocker here, but I think as usual, you're just better off eyeballing the chart as opposed to using some sort of metric to measure those things. But people like indicators, and if that's your 
cup of tea. And if you want to do that, again, as I say almost every week, probably, it's not my way or the highway, okay? Uh, do what you'd like. Do what you want. I don't want to stop you from going out and doing research. I've done all these things, and it's taken me a long time to come back to the chart and just the chart. Now, why did I say we were oversold a while back? Well, the market was up here at new highs and implodes over a couple of weeks, and now it's down 6%. Okay, That's a pretty substantial move relative to the volatility of the market. Okay, um, the little gold stock just talking about A and V, it's up almost 6% today. That's not that big of a deal. It was down almost 6% or more yesterday. Okay, and then the market went straight back up. So now it became overbought really, really fast. Now, yesterday we had an outside day down. So let's get this out the way real quick here. Meaning that the market rallied up and then came back in. The candle people probably call it a a fat man who just ate a little baby or something. I don't know what it's called in candle terms, but I'm sure that's pretty ominous. Me? Eh, I don't get too excited. It's just one bar. It did stall out here, and then today, market's going right back up. So this is why you don't want to get too excited and sell the forum just because you have this situation happen here. But Dave, how should we handle an overbought situation? Well, I think, I'm glad you asked, I think we should... Uh, I think we should be careful buying into a market when it's like this. I'd much rather let things shake out and see what happens. The good news is, as I've said quite a bit lately, is we haven't gotten a whole lot of new setups recently, and that has kept us out of new trouble. Okay. Uh, any questions on a sumo wrestler who just ate a little baby or overbought, oversold? Okay. Well, I'm going to say poopy diaper. People say I talk that too. I say that too much. <laughs> There's the ominous candle pattern: the baby with the poopy diaper. <laughs> a banded baby with a poopy diaper. Okay. Well, you know, I make fun of the candle people, and there are some very successful candle people out there. So I can't say it as a blanket statement, but one of the problems with the candle pattern, yeah, Carol, no, it's an engulfing pattern. I actually, I pretend not to know candles, but I've studied them before. I've studied everything at some point in time. I'm not saying that to be braggadocious. I'm just saying that I went off on a holy grail hunt, as I think we all did. And yeah, uh, Carol's right. That is an engulfing pattern. I think it's a pregnant woman engulfing a little baby um, after it had a poopy diaper. I don't know, something like that. Anyway, the reason I make fun of those names and silly things is because the candle people, it's always a pattern. No matter what's going on, it's always a pattern, okay? Three birds crapping on a wire, the aforementioned baby with a poopy diaper. It's always something, okay? Three black crows, one flew away. I mean, you know, whatever. Uh, it's not always a pattern in the market. Sometimes it just goes up and goes down. And it's not always the most ominous thing in the world. I'm sure the candle people got all excited yesterday because you had an outside day near these new highs in here. And that's not a good thing. Like I said in my piece this morning, uh, when your market begins to make new highs or approaches these new highs, I should say, it's going to suck in the Johnny come lately because they're like, oh, this thing is going to make new highs. I better get in as early as possible. Well, it's too late at that point anyway. But and that's going to be the fast money, and they tend to be quickest to dump. But evidently, a lot of them already got shaken out because what's happening? Market's going back up today. So don't get too caught up in this, but do be cautious about buying a market that's going straight up for a couple of weeks. Very hard for it to sustain that. And as I said quite a bit with these V-shaped recoveries at a high level, it's very hard for that new leg to start on an old leg. Now, if you go back to 2009, in the market, let's say market just goes down, 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 down forever, and then you have a spike down and it comes right back. That could be the mother of all bottoms. It's just when you have it at high levels like this, I get a little nervous when it looks like that. Okay. All right. Any questions? You're welcome, Carol. <laughs> Bob likes candles. Well, good for you, Bob. Why don't you light a few for me? <laughs> No, it's not my way a highway. You know that, Bob. You could, um, if you like candles, use candles. Uh, I use candles for quite a while because I like the way they would show me the bar, and I could see the up bars and the down bars. Uh, one thing I found, though, it did give me 
a little bit of a bias in there, which may not have been a bad thing. If you got a lot of red candles, you kind of it makes you think, well, maybe this market's weak. I, I need to be careful, whatever. But as I think I've said at nauseam, um, I was trained by some old school guys who are helping out many years ago, and they are, I guess, slow to change, and, and they, I'm sure they they've never seen the candles uh, <laughs> in their life. So I uh, went back to the Western charts, and I've never looked back. But that's okay. Yeah, I like candles on my birthday cake, too. It means I'm still alive, which I think is a good thing. All right. Um, let's talk about smoke if you got them. As I've been saying quite a bit, I think one thing that's crucial to the methodology, and something I never really realized until I got on a project with a bunch of other brainiacs. I'm not saying I'm a brainiac, but the people on the project were very smart. And I, I think it's safe to say all of which are smarter than me. And um, I just sat back and watched them put all their trades in and do their trades. And, and, and it was pretty cool and fascinating. And then whenever I just wait and wait and wait. And whenever my pitch came to me, my setups came to me, I'd put in my setups. And I would give, they wanted to see a high risk to reward. I'm sorry, a high reward to risk. Okay little risk, big reward type of trades. Well, the way I trade, you're looking at one to one on the first loaf, but I would make these big picture predictions like five to one or 10 to one on the second loaf. And in some cases, they actually came true. Now, the reason I made those big picture predictions was I looked at where the market was longer term and I said, okay, well, I think it could be, it could go back there. We're going to take a look at this exact thing in A and V. But I think what was kind of interesting is, and it's kind of like those Geico commercials, you know, doesn't every, everybody knows that. I thought everybody knew that the way to trade was to scale out and then trail, and then more importantly, loosen a stop up. But I've had several people, including some PhDs, actually come and say, hey, Dave, that's pretty cool. I like the way you do that. So I'm kind of excited about that. It reaffirms uh, what I do. And if you ever see me getting cocky in this business, just – slap me over the head or, or shoot me an email and let me know because it's very hard to be cocky for long because the market will humble you. So I'm very humbled often. And when I get that sort of confirmation from someone else, especially some of these peers who I have utmost respect for, it makes me feel pretty good. So I think that there's definitely something here, especially in the widening of the stop, making that transition from the shorter term setup to the longer term setup. Now let's talk about what happened here. Uh, this is a little gold stock, as you know. It was funny, it was on the radio yesterday. I'm, I'm jumping ahead of myself. And and uh, right at the end, he kind of caught me off guard. I thought we were done with the segment. He goes, hey, Dave. He, and he's like, yeah, it's like you got to give me a stock that will go up 50 bucks. And I said, A and V. <laughs> and then when he saw it was $5 a share, he's like, oh, my goodness, it's $5 a share. So, But I think it can go up 50 bucks, and I'll show you why in just one second. But in the meantime, because we don't know, Okay, we take we took an entry on here, and then we took partial profits up here. Now I have it shown as a quantum leap, but in reality, you would trail that stop higher, and then once you hit your partial profit, then you bump it to break even. But just for purposes of explaining things, you take this stop here, and you make sure you get it all the way up to break even. Now the worst you could do barring overnight gaps is a scratch out on the remaining shares. And then, you know what? It's better than a poke in the eye. We'll look at the portfolio in one second. I'll show you what that would look like. But even with uh, today's little spill, today it's coming back, uh, yesterday's little spill, I should say, uh, today it's come back nicely so far. Where is it? About 560 or so. It's right in here, right about there. So it's, so far it's turning back up, and hopefully we're in this thing for a long, long time. Now, it stops a little tight now. But once this thing breaks out to do highs, we're going to let that stop widen out often by doing nothing or not doing anything, I should say. So if your stop is here and then the market goes up to here, then that stop has now widened out to that level. Okay. So unless this thing makes a pretty serious new high, unless it makes a pretty serious new high in here, I am not going to bump that stop higher. So if it just comes up here and makes a marginal new high, then I'll leave that stop where it is. And again, now the stop that was, let's say, 
let's say the day before it was right here, the stop that was this wide now becomes a stop that is this wide has opened up a little bit, okay? In other words, it's going to look like it's going to go from here that wide to this wide simply by not doing anything. And that's the secret of trading, if there is a secret to trading. Now, why do I think this stock could go up 50 bucks? Well, because you go way back here to this chart, it was up in the 40s, okay? And you can see something pretty cool is, notice that you bow tied, bow tied down here, not quite off of all-time highs, but off of multi-year highs, I, I think. And notice that bow tie stayed in place all the way until, believe it or not, right there. And we'll zoom in on that in just one second. So this is what I call like a Phoenix stock. The stock falls from grace. Company gets their act together. In this particular case, gold has dropped for a few years, so that didn't help. So now I think the stock has a potential to go back to its old highs, okay? But do I know that's going to happen? Hell no. If I knew it was going to happen, I'd put all my money into this one stock and watch it go up, and I'd be pretty happy, 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 okay? But I don't know that, so what I do is I wait first for the entry. I put a stop in in case I'm wrong. I take some partial profits, and then I bump that stop up to break even. I know I beat the dead horse on this, but a lot of people um, don't fully understand that concept. Okay, Now, any question about what we covered so far before I talk about ebb and flow and then talk a little bit about the portfolio? Dave, can you repeat the widening point about stop, stock, stop selection? You said it was key to trading and I missed it. Okay, Jonathan, no problem. Okay. Y'all bear with me, those of you who already know this, okay? Um, on this particular day, we brought our stop to break even, okay? So now the stop is this far away from the market. Now, we're not going to bump that stop higher until this stock makes a new high. But if this stock just makes a marginal new high, let's say the biggest our stop has ever been so far was a point, okay? Let's say it was one point total, okay? plus one and let's say it goes up and it's 10 cents and we just don't do anything we sit on our hands leave that stop right here at break even well now that stop is now a buck 10 cent okay and let's say it has uh, let's say it jumps another buck and now we're at two dollars and ten cents well we don't we might not want to let it widen out that much so we'll bump it up let's say mm, 80 cents okay and then, so, what's 210 minus 80? Okay, buck 30. So now our stop is going to be about a buck 30. Okay, so we let it wide out another 20 cents. Okay, and you keep doing that until it gets somewhat extreme. And sometimes what will happen is, and it's, this is where it gets really cool. This is where I get really excited. It's like, let's say you follow it, you follow it, you let it wide now, and then the market corrects. It makes a little base, and then somehow when you, when you follow it and let it wind out, you end up with a stop that's like right below that base. And then it takes off again, and you let it just kind of wind out a little bit more. And then this way, you end up where the stock can ride out. You can ride out these corrections, and you'll get these big sideways bases in here. Um, if you're okay with letting markets, you don't want to let too much of your profits retrace, but if you're okay with letting a substantial amount retrace, then you can wait for that correction, wait for that market to take off again, and then you just make that one stair step up higher like this with your stop. But what I do is I let it widen out as it moves, and eventually it turns into this longer-term stop. So you have two hats. Let's see if I can draw a hat. Okay. You got two hats you wear. You got Mr. Trader. And you got Mr. Trender, for lack of a better word. Okay. Now, if you're going to try longer-term trend following, the problem with longer-term trend following is when you get into stock right here, you better put in your stop down here somewhere because you need to give things a lot of room for a long-term gain. But you can come in and get a swing trade like we did here from there to there over a quick period. What was that? Let's see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. About two weeks, okay, thereabouts. So in two weeks, you got a pretty darn good gain, 
something percent in the stock, it's better than poking the eye. You take those partial profits, you bump that stop to break even. So Mr. Trader here, he's got what he wants, okay? Now Mr. Trend Dude, okay? He's going to get what he wants. We're going to slowly transition over to Mr. Trend Dude. And the way we're going to do that is we're going to let these stops slowly widen out until we get that nice wide trend following stop. Now, keep in mind, as I've talked about this quite a bit, and uh, it was brought up quite a bit in, in, uh, in Curtis Face Turtle Book, which, which I've, I agree with this part about the turtles, but I don't agree with the longer term trend following in general. I think the way you get to the longer term trend following is through scaling out like I do. But to each his own. Uh, the problem is with those longer term trend following systems from the get go, your drawdowns are going to be abysmal. But one thing they did talk about, before I go too far to bring it all together, one thing they did talk about was they treated drawdowns to open profits differently than drawdowns to losses. And I totally agree with them on that. So you have to be willing to give up some gains, as I often do. And we haven't had any huge winners lately. It's kind of been uh, normally distribution, which is a bit of distributed, which is a bit of an aberration. And I'm going to get to that in one second, too. But when you get these big movements in stocks up, uh, let's say, 50%, well, a lot of times you might have a retracement that's so big in that, then you're only up 25%. Then it goes up to 100%. Then you have a pretty big retracement again. And I'll show you these. I've shown these charts before where you have these big retracements. So as you are transitioning into that longer-term trend follower on that position, you have to be willing to give up a lot of those open profits and if you get knocked out so what look at what you have accomplished on a net net basis okay we had up one it was up 150 percent or 100 something or whatever and we only got 100 percent well let me tell you something if i only got 100 percent on every trade you would never see my fat ass again right no i would come back to taunt you guys but because you're not going to get that on every trade so why would you be bummed out if you got 100% just because you were up maybe 125 or 150% the week before? So what? Look at what you did on a net net basis. Pat yourself on the back, okay? You need a lot of money to be a longer-term trend follower. You can take months for profit. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Well, you do. You, you do. But, okay, his, his point is you need to be a lot of money for a long-term trend trader. So let's say, yeah, you get the stock and you got a wide, wide stop way down here. You got to wait, 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 wait. If you're taking those partial profits, not all the time, but if you set yourself up properly, you get a pretty quick gain out, okay? Put some money in your pocket, free up some margin, free up some money, and then just ride that winner and ride that profit out, okay? Question is, how do I set my target on A and V? The target is the same distance as the stop, okay? The stop is set by eyeballing how much the stock moves around on a day-to-day -day basis. And you also want to look at where the stock was. Is there a base around somewhere around that it shouldn't go back in or some other technical pattern possibly? And it seemed like a lot, one buck on a $5 stock. But when you look at the chart, stop is just right here. Here's the low of the pullback, so you're really not that far away from that. So we decided it was one buck, okay? I guess in this case I decided. And then we took profits at one buck, so it's a one-to-one -one relationship. Uh, go in, and if you download, I did quite a few webinars on R, meaning risk, and R, meaning reward. In fact, it's probably not worth buying them individual. Just get the thumb drive. Um, for 2000 and I think the second half of 2013. Look at my website and see when they were. And I go through painstaking detail about how that this does not have a negative expectancy and how it does work out. And if you watch these ongoing webinars, hopefully you'll see more and more profitable portfolios in here. Okay? Just how that works. Okay? Oh, you're welcome, John. Good. Okay. You get it. Good. Uh, do you prefer to use present trailing stop versus dollar side trailing stop? Uh, it doesn't matter, okay? Um, I, I guess if you look at the way I look at it, uh, on this A and V, I'm at $1, okay? Um, and when it goes 
or if it goes, I should say if, because it's not a done deal yet. But if it starts making new highs, that one dollar is going to probably become like one ten. And then, um, as I've said before, it, this works a little bit better with higher price stocks. But you can kind of play little games, and this is in this is in layman's, okay? And how could you, you know, this gentleman earlier? How can he know all this? I, I guess he knows everything. But uh, let's say you're at a, a somewhat higher price stock, or let's say the stock gets gets up in the twenties. And let's say it goes up 25 cents one day. Well, I'll just say keep the change, okay? I'll wait till it gets to 21 before I start to uh, maybe tighten that stop a little bit. If it just goes up a little bit each day, I don't do anything, and that sort of uh, by playing that game allows me to widen that stop out by not doing anything. So I do it on a point basis, and I let it widen out to a point where I think that if the stock retraces, all the way down to that stop, I'm obviously wrong. But I let it widen out quite a bit. And those of you who've been around for a while, you'll know that we've had stocks go two years or more and in these nice little trends. So it can happen, not on everyone. Uh, but it, it doesn't matter where you're using percent or dollar. As long as you're outside of the normal volatility and as long as your stop has been widened to ride out the longer-term corrections, you're going to do just fine. Okay? Gotcha. Would you add at that base? No, you don't necessarily add at a base or anything. Um, you don't add on to positions unless you get a setup again. So if you were swing trading around a position, well, let's say on the downside, let's this makes a good example, okay? Let's say you shorted it after this bow tie and you took partial profits here. Well, it pulls back again. Well, let's say you put on some shares here and then you took partial profits here. Then you put on some shares here. Then you took partial profits here, and then you put on some shares here. You know, rinse and repeat. I mean, this is a perfect example. Rarely does that happen. I mean, just by accident, I have it up on this chart. But you would only put on shares during those pullbacks, or on the upside, it will look like this, okay? So with A and V, what's going to have to happen now is it's going to have to set up again as a pullback. And the fact that it's already traded higher today, maybe it'll make new highs first, but then it pulls back again. Yeah, you might want to consider an add-on trade. Now, I don't actually add the actual trade on in my service, but I will tell people, hey, this stock is set up again for those of you who want to. Explain what normal volatility is. Uh, normal volatility, uh, read about it in layman's. Uh, whatever the, you look at the HV, you look at how much the stock bounces around a little, a lot, oh, yeah. you look at how much the stock bounces around and that gives you a good feel for the volatility. I'm not a big fan of ATR, but I think empirically I'm using ATR, average true range. A lot of people like to noodle with that. I have no problem with it. It makes a lot of sense. Um, I just look at the HV of the, of the stock, okay, and then I look at the bars, and I look at for wide range bars and recent activity, and then I look further back to see what's going on in the stock, and I mostly focus on what's going on shorter term. And I want to stay out of that shorter-term volatility. Now, the problem is you could say, okay, well, let's take a two-week volatility. Well, statistically, that might be pretty wide if you need to be out of that normal volatility. Statistically, you might have a stop way down here. And that's why I don't use statistics to do that. What I do instead is I say, okay, what's the tightest I could possibly put this stop where I know I'd be, I might be wrong. There's a good chance that I'm wrong if it gets hit. And it's still far enough away to where I could ride out a correction. And in this particular case, I came up with a one-point stop thereabouts, okay? And that's how I set that one. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of this, but Jonathan has a good point. You can also locate good stop areas on an hourly chart as it rallies. You can, and that's fine. I'm not a huge fan of doing that because the problem, when you start digging deeper, okay? So let's say you look at an hourly chart. Well, now you've got... Um, Anybody know exactly how many hours in a trading day? Six and a half or six, I forget. Let's just say six round numbers until I can do the math. If somebody could do the math for me real quick. Um, so let's say you look at an hourly chart. Well, now you've got six bars in here to work with, okay? And then if you, get, if you look at the minutia too much before you know it, you're going to be looking at, uh, okay, Greg, have a good day. Uh, you're going to be looking at, you're going to get caught up sometimes in the, um, and the minutia of everything, and then these moves intraday are going to look a little bigger than they really are. Like on this particular day here, it probably looked like the, the world was ending because this stock probably looked like that, okay? If we have time, we can look at it later. 
and you're like, oh my goodness, well that's just one bar, but if you look at six or seven bars for, to make up that one bar, then it's going to look like the world's ending. But I hear what he's saying. He's saying that if you find a lot of support, if, if you have a couple of days that look like that, and then the stock moves on, then maybe that area is an area of support that should not be violated. I don't have a problem with doing that. Uh, again, my problem comes when you watch it too close. You get a little too close to the market by looking at those intraday charts. Okay. Um, one thing we talk a lot about in here is, and this is, I'm going to get to those questions, I promise. Just give me a second. I'll, I'll get back to those. Uh, let me just get through the slides so I know we have time to talk about everything. Uh, one thing I get a lot of questions on, or we talk about quite a bit, I should say, is the um, is letting the market prune your portfolio, and by that means that you have a stop in place. And on this particular stock here, eighty four fifty, we failed miserably, but so what? Um, the loss turned into a thousand dollars on both of these. Okay, so the stock comes out of the portfolio. Well, if you take that one out, all you're left with mostly except for this one down here is winners and we'll take a look at what that looks like okay so your open portfolio now looks like this now I want to show you a couple of things in here which are pretty cool and one of which is that we got rid of that losing trade and by getting rid of the losers we're left with almost almost being the you know, keyword in that sentence all winners except for this one so how many positions do we have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You got eight positions on, and nine if you count this one. Uh, but let's just look at the mechanical portfolio. So you got seven out of eight positions are profitable. That doesn't always happen, but that's kind of cool when it does. And it's the other thing I wanted to show you is usually when you see this portfolio, let's just use round numbers. You'll see, like, let's say you see a number like 10,000 down here. Well, there'll be one in here that's like 6,000. So it's like the majority of the gains are often skewed and in one particular position. Uh, right now, they're kind of evenly distributed, okay? And we got a couple of decent winners in here. This one's a decent winner, and this one's a decent winner. But it's still not that big of a number relative to everything else. And those numbers usually are a lot bigger, and usually it's a lot more skewed than 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 this but still those two stocks especially if you take the if you add them all up with the profits and all they still make up a substantial a substantial he tried to say part of the portfolio in fact we could do that real quick Yeah, it still comes to half, so it's still skewed, okay? Well, not quite half, but anyway, the point is, if you add these numbers up, it still comes to a substantial um, amount of gains in here. But for the most part, it's fairly evenly skewed, okay? Now, here's the other beauty of what's going on with this portfolio. This is why I put nice stripes in here, is because every time a partial position gets exited, I unhighlight it, okay? So you can see that one, two, three, four, five, six out of eight of these positions have hit the initial profit targets. So boring overnight gaps, those are going to be six winning trades overall. And the beauty of that is maybe not so much on this one, but maybe on some of these ones in here that have already exceeded the initial profit target, especially like this A and V maybe. It's going to come back with a vengeance, hopefully. Go up that 50 bucks, I said. Then you're going to have some really big winners in the portfolio. And what you're doing here is you're positioning yourself so you can have those possible big winners in here on the second loaf. And trust me, this is where the real money is on that second loaf. Okay? Lots of questions in here. Uh, can I use the 50-day moving average as trailing stop? Well, that 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 might have its problems. Uh, in some cases, it might work out though. Now, what happens is I'm often asked. Let's just let's take a look at like um, let's take a look at the A and V since we're picking on that one today. And let's add in that moving average. Let's add in a 50-day moving average. Okay. Um, 
what happens with my the way that I do my stops is I kind of bump them and bump them when the market moves in my favor and then it would get bumped to break even or whenever on this particular day. Well, if you connect the dots here, it's going to start looking like a longer term mover, moving average. Okay. So, and I've actually noodled with in the past, starting off with a, a shorter period moving average and increasing the periods of the moving average to where you end up with a longer period moving average, like the 50 day moving average. Okay. Um, there's nothing wrong with using the 50 day moving average except that it's 50 days of trading. So let's say the stock blasts higher. Let's say the stock goes 100% higher, which it could do. Okay. Uh, the little uranium stock we're in is probably more, more likely to do that. Well, if it does that, then that moving average is going to take a long time to catch up to price. So that's the only problem with using a moving average. But I hear you. Anything that sort of trails behind the price and is price based can be used as a moving average. It's not my way or highway. So noodle around with that. Like I said, I've tried a little bit of everything. Now I'm just a discretionary trader, and that's how I became a discretionary trader. But if something makes sense to you, then by all means, use it, okay? Do what you think is right for you, okay? Isn't your PL wrong because you retain your winners when you take the first loaf but drop off your stop out position? Should you also remove your first loaf? Well, sort of. I hear what you're saying. Um, you're the first person to ever ask that. I've always wondered why nobody ever asked that, you know. He's saying, is the P&L wrong because you're leaving the first loaf in? Well, I'm not moving this to closed trades. The closed trades are down here, okay. So I don't move the whole, I take the whole position, I move the whole position at once, okay. So yeah, it's a, you, some of this is closed is closed profits based on these in here. But hopefully this number here gets so big then that the first loaf doesn't matter. And it also helps to see that okay, we got we got a little bit more than what we wanted on that. It's just the way I like to do it because I don't like to separate the whole trade once or if let's say this this trade LIOX stops out, then I move the whole thing down to the bottom, okay? And then I adjust this number so I know what my net net change is. To each his own, though, you don't you can track them however you want. But I like to see how much money I made on these stocks. Okay, I like to look at A and B and say, okay, I made a thousand bucks of that stock so far. And then today, when I put in today's price, which would be a little bit bigger than this, I see what I made on the second loaf on that. Okay, it's just easier for me to track them as a whole. But hey. You want this spreadsheet? I'll give it to you, and you can track it however you want. Okay. So yeah, I'm not trying to hide. I'm not trying to uh, be disingenuous and say that, um, you know, these aren't closed trades. That's why we have them unhighlighted. Okay. But I'm not showing these as closed trades down here until the entire trade closes out. Then I move it down here. For me, it's just easier to track that way. Okay. Why do you break it into two loaves? Okay. Well, it makes it conceptually, it makes it easier for me to understand to see. Okay, um, so in this particular stock, it would have been 250 shares. Now, if you're, this is just the portfolio. This is a hypothetical portfolio in your own account. You might have went with three. You might have done it with more of a round number on that. Okay, but it makes it easier for me to see. Okay, I'm going to take one of these. It, it's going to be my, what's that? The little guy with the little hat that says trading and then this one's going to be the one that becomes trending for me if you divide them up like in this particular case you'd buy 4,000 shares at one time but divide them into two chunks makes it a lot easier okay um, sometimes I don't track certain things in my accounts and uh, like this like I track them as well as I do on anything I recommend in a service and I find myself if I got that 4,000 share position I don't see it as two 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 thousand share positions. I see it as a whole position, and, and psychologically, when things are going really well, I find myself wanting to hold on to that whole position. And then, of course, when things begin to tank, then I wish I would have sold half. But by putting it in a spreadsheet like this and dividing it into two, I don't know 
what to, I don't know how to explain it psychologically other than you could see it as two different positions and it works for me. Like I said, if I don't put trades into a spreadsheet and look at them like this, I, I see the whole thing and then I find myself wanting to hold on to the whole thing and, I, and I'm less inclined to want to take those profits. Okay. How do we get the spreadsheet template? You email me and I'll send you one similar to this or I might even I've got a lot of trades down here, and this is discretion and some stuff down here is proprietary. Um, but I'll be happy to uh, give you the um, spreadsheet, the live spreadsheet. If you want this live spreadsheet, I'll uh, make a copy for you. I'd be happy to do that. Yeah, I mean, you know, I'm, I'm, I, I work a lot off the old internet model. Give everything away and make it up in volume. <laughs> no, I don't give everything away. Hey, yeah, Luke, just shoot me an email. I'll be happy to email it to you. All right, Don has an answer. If you have 65 minutes, you will have six bars per day. At 60 minutes, Bear give you 6.5 bars a day, which slightly screwed between days. Yeah, I mean, yeah, it does. One day kind of goes into the next or whatever. What percentage of the position comes off the first target? 50%, one half. What do you mean by discretionary trade? Okay, discretionary trader means that, first of all, I look through 2,000 stocks, and then I decide which ones, if any, I want to trade. I don't push a button, get a peanut, push a button, and some trade spit out, and I take those trades no matter what's going on. I make a decision on which trades I'm going to take. And then I decide where I'm going to get in that trade, where I'm going to get out, okay, and how I'm going to trail that profit, okay. So I make all these discretionary decisions. And let's say in this particular case right here, let's just say this stops at five to make the math easy, okay. Let's say the stock comes down and hits five. Am I going to exit? Should I exit this trade? I don't know. I might use a little discretion. You know what? I got a brain in my head. I'm not a big institution. I could be more nimble than they can. Like I said, I'm reading David and Goliath by uh, Gladwell. It's a good book. Reaffirms a lot of stuff that I do. Uh, read it if you get a chance. It's on my website. Check it out. Uh, I might get out, but what I'll probably do is I'll just say, well, wait a minute. Let's just see if this thing starts going back up. Okay, read the second half of Layman's Guide to Trading Stocks. Read about stock nicks, okay? That means I'm going to exercise discretion when it comes to getting out. Now, if it keeps dropping, then I'm going to say, all right, you know what? I'm wrong. Let me get out. I got to hurt a little bit worse than I intended, but I followed my general plan. So that's what discretion means. I'm not following everything mechanical. Now, when you see the spreadsheet, okay, this is following everything mechanical. But like, for instance, on this particular day here, I think it was this one, and it might have been this one too, or one of these in here. I know it happened with SPWR a while back. The stock, actually, you would have actually made a lot more money oh, on this one here, I think. You actually would have made a few hundred dollars more on that day because it gapped. Like, here's your, let's see if we can do a white screen real quick on the fly. Okay, let's say that you're looking for this much gains on your first position. Let's say it gaps up here and it keeps on going, okay? And this is this is your your daily chart, a, a one-day bar, okay? So instead of taking profits right here, which mechanically you would sp supposed to, you just say, you know what? Even if it comes all the way back to here, I still got the profit I want in the first loaf. I'm going to sit back and relax. And then by the end of the day, I'm going to get out of that position. Now you could also trail it intraday or whatever you want. So in that particular case, you just squeezed out a lot more profits and you actually beat the system as opposed to following it strictly on a mechanical basis. Okay? But, yeah, everything that's, that's in the spreadsheet is mechanical. And these fills are either I use real fills or I use time and sell fills uh, or I get a real fill from somewhere else, from another account or something. So I know that these are realistic numbers in here, okay? But everything for um, legal purposes is hypothetical, okay? Okay, hold off on this. We got a lot of questions coming in, so hold off on the individual stocks if you don't mind. Uh, I'll be happy. I'll get to those in just one second. Can you transfer over some winning trades into the template? <laughs> Oh, you want me to send you some winning trades? I'd be happy to do that. Okay, Scott, your uh, question got cut off. Do you prefer using 
Um, depends on what I'm using, I guess. Oh, okay. You said in reality you'd be moving the stop up to break even as it went from buy the first setup. Okay, no, Carol. Uh, let me show you what I mean by that. Um, and it, I did the same thing in Layman's as one example. Uh, it makes it look like the, the stop went, it made it look like we leave the stop way down here until we hit the initial profit target and then we bump it up. And actually, that's exactly what I do in my institutional consulting business, okay? Because I don't, I don't handhold nearly as much. I just let things shake out. I know I'm going to be wrong more, but I also know that I'm going to be right big. And I seem to get more of a pass on the institutional side about being wrong more. I think, I think everybody knows that you will be wrong. Um, on the retail side, except for you guys who are very intelligent, uh, a lot of people think that you should be right all the time, and it just doesn't work that way. Um, but I'm a lot more hands off. But what I, what I will do in this particular case, let's as the stock moves in my favor, in this particular case, I may not have bumped that stop, and it may have been that quantum jump. But reread the second half of Layman's when I talk about money management. I have a graphic in there, and it looks like I just make this one move on the stop. But in reality, is especially if the stock just kind of worked its way higher until it finally hit that private target, then your trailing stop would look more like this on a day-to-day -day basis, and then it would be bumped up to break even then and not in one quantum leap, okay? I'm at work and have to run. It's my first webinar with you. It's available view, viewing later. Uh, Sherry, I, re, I, uh, I record them, and I, uh, there's a small nominal fee that I charge for processing for storage space and, and such. So, yeah, you could always watch these if you miss them, and then you can get an entire year history if you want on um, flash drives. The uh, live shows are always free. Yeah, I, you know, and I didn't want to open that can of worms, Howard, just because we've, we've got a lot to talk about today. But it, you bring up a great point. Howard said something about using EMA as a trailing stop. Absolutely, because a simple moving average is going to be slower to catch up to the price. Again, I just like to do it my way. Uh, but if you want to look use a moving average or something, then I think that that's viable. Uh, as long as what you're doing is conceptually correct, okay, then you don't have to worry about it, okay. And you know what, Sherry, I'm not going to nickel a dime you. Just email me. I'll, I'll give you a copy of this. Okay. Okay. Uh, any questions on money management? Your intro in A and B would have been a TKO on a 127 bar. Well, you had a lot of big picture stuff that's working on A and V, uh, as opposed to just a small setup. You had this. You had this massive base in here. Okay after this thing has fall, fallen from grace, like I said, it's, it's a Phoenix stock, okay? And then you actually had a bow tie way back here, which had got you in even earlier. So it's like, well, wait a minute, I've got a bow tie off of all-time lows. I know a major bottom is in place on this stock, so I'm looking for a place to entry. And in this particular case, I've got a, a bit of a pullback, cup and handle type of pattern. Uh, this is somewhat of a TKO. I hear what you're saying. Um, but you, you can call it a TKO if you want. It has a bit of a double top knockout look to it. But for me to call something a TKO, I want to see a strong, strong, strong trend, and then I want to see a big knockout, okay? Whereas this is something that's making a big bottom, and I'm not looking for that big uh, retrace in price. In fact, your bow tie moving average thing would have triggered right here, believe it or not, at 4 bucks a share, okay? Hey, Dave, you're not beating a dead horse. I'm glad you went over this again with A&V. It strengthens the point of what you're doing. Thanks. Yeah, you know, and, and that's the other thing. If I read someone else, what someone else is doing or look at something, and it's similar to what I'm doing, it reaffirms what I'm doing. And you're like, well, why do I need so much um, reaffirmation? So what's, what's the word I'm looking for, for want of a better word? Uh, why do I need so much what am I looking for? Uh, support or a confirmation? Well, it's just good to have because you always have a little bit of doubt in this business when things begin to go a little sour. And it's good to know that you're doing the right thing. And some a lot of research I do backs up what I'm doing and, and 
but um, and then when I get on projects where uh, with these institutions where I'm doing some sort of um, analysis and I'm doing the scaling out and everything and they're like whoa that's cool Dave I like that so you know uh, it's good it makes you feel good to get a little uh, confirmation of what you're doing all right uh, I left this slide in here just because I like the graphic it's just cool <laughs> But the pressure's off. Uh, predicting the market is tough. It's hard. It's the hardest thing you'll ever do. It's much easier, not easy, but much easier to go in and find an inefficient, inefficient stock like the A and B and the NG uh, or what, all the other stocks in that portfolio, the solar stocks, uh, those biotechs that are poised to make big picture moves. And I did the, as you know, I mean, I'll probably – soft sell it here in just a minute, but I did the stock selection webinar a couple of months ago back in December, and uh, quite a few of you here uh, were there, so thank you for that. Uh, but the point I want to make is I spent a lot of time talking about inefficiency and the importance of inefficiency and finding that little gold stock, that little biotech stock, that IPO that has the potential to double, triple, quadruple over time. You're going to do much better off than trying to trade E-minis which is going to move 2% over two weeks. You know, maybe every now and then you'll get lucky, like recently, and has a sharp move in one direction. But you can't hold on to it longer term because what happened? It went straight back up. So it's much harder to trade an efficient market like an index. And then take a look at what the indices did. I mean, we had a fat baby pooping in a diaper um, yesterday. It looked a little ominous. So that would be... To be, that would be like, well, if I was trading overbought, oversold, and candle patterns, I would be shorting with both hit, uh, both fits. Fist, uh, he said. I just Did I just say short with both tits? I did. <laughs> that didn't make any sense. Uh, short with both fists, right? And then what happens today? I get my buttocks handed to me. I get my tits in a ringer. How's that? Uh, <laughs> I think our show is taking a turn, Dave. <laughs> But anyway, the pressure's off, so don't kill yourself trying to predict the market. If it's in an obvious uptrend, an obvious downtrend, that's fine. But when it starts getting a little iffy like this, don't stress out over it. Don't stress if you have some shorts on and the market is going up. Don't rush out and sell everything because we had one short. Even though the market was making new highs, it actually paid off pretty nice for us. We had another short. Even though the market rolled over, it stopped us out. So let the market do the... Um, let the uh, <laughs> you make you guys are making me laugh. Stop! <laughs> so let the market make the decisions for you. The pressure's off. I'm literally holding my hand over the screen. The jokes are coming in. <laughs> Short with both tits. Is that a candle pattern? <laughs> Richard says I just wet my shorts for laughing so much about the tits. Oh, we got to get on. You know, my apologies to the ladies in here. I did not mean to go off on that tangent. All right, a couple of random thoughts before we hop out to the markets. Um, again, take things one day at a time. Uh, let the market come to you. This is I left a couple of these in from a couple of weeks past, but uh, prior. But let the market come to you. And I told my peeps this the other night uh, on the service. It, it, this was the first night in a while where I didn't have any setups uh, that I wanted to show for the next day. And I said, you know what, I don't really like what I see in the database. I'm not excited about anything at this juncture. So I'm not going to do anything. And it took me a long time to get to that point. And I think I was probably getting there, oh, I don't know, 13 years ago or 14 years ago, whenever it was, back in the days when I first started writing the Internet commentary, maybe 15 years ago, um, on trading markets. And I felt like I always had to have action and I always had to do things. And one thing I learned is that uh, human nature is that humans crave action. And when I would recommend stocks, even though they were mediocre and I didn't want to, but I felt pressure like I had to come up with something. So I, I recommended the best of the worst and it didn't work. Nobody complained. But if I didn't recommend anything, I would lose subscribers. And the salespeople over there were pressuring me to produce a little more and I realized you know what I'm gonna take the high road and do what I'm supposed to do and you know what I'm gonna produce even less and it's kinda like a more Papa John's type of trades better ingredients better pizza so better 
better setups, better trades, better trends, however you want to look at it. And I'm going to learn to be patient, and, and that's one of those um, many epiphanies that I had. And I, that could have gone horribly wrong. I could have, uh, being under pressure to produce, could have put me in a different situation. It didn't when I was on this project, as I've said quite a bit, a while back. I only got paid if I recommended something. But because I could sing like I didn't need the money, it was just one little project I was working on, I didn't recommend anything until the time came and I was able to hit the cover off the ball on the project. And that's from simply by being patient. I don't think I did anything. I know I'm always bragging on this, but it's it's not bragging. It's just patience. It's like if you look at what I did, I did mostly nothing. I sat around for three months waiting for the market to set up just right with the setups, and then I took the setups, and that's the best thing you could do. So let the market come to you. Be patient and continue to play a good offense. I mean, my goal, as I've been saying, ever since I've did that, I've done that stock webinar uh, for 2014, is to become a better stock picker. As I said last week, it's deliberate practice. When I'm looking at my charts, I'm thinking, how can I get better and better and better? And deliberate practice is going to make you a famous musician, or it's going to make you a good uh, surgeon or whatever your profession is, and it's also going to make you a much better stock picker and better ingredients, better trades. You start getting your stock picking down. So that's my goal, obviously, in 2014. Not that it always wasn't, but now that I've made it a conscious decision, you know, now check back later when things get a little iffy, but now that it's made, made it such a conscious decision, I found that my stock picking has become even better, and I think you too can get better too. Just keep working on it and keep chipping away at it, okay? I think we feel other people are smarter than we are. I like looking for approval for what we are doing, sort of like giving a class for free people who think there's less value than it to a point when you're making if they pay $500. Yeah, yeah, uh, yeah, yeah, okay, yeah, no problem. I, I agree. Is Mrs. Landry listening to this one? No. <laughs> Uh, she's, she'd beat me over the head. She'd be mad at me. <laughs> All right, a couple of announcements. Um, stock selection webinar is still available, and then I'm throwing in six months of the service with that. And uh, these are the actual stocks we picked in the webinar. If you look at the website, you can see, and these are the actual gains without money management, and there'd still be a few of these positions that are still open. And I still have a couple of um, follow-up webinars that you will be able to attend if you um, go with that. Um, volume 2, we can charge 2,000. People ask me all the time, Dave, where can I find these shows? And, and I know I preach ad nauseum in, the, uh, in these shows and in the uh, newsletter. But if you want all the archives, you can get them um, through off my website. The, uh, it's much cheaper to get them. I've got a lot of people that will buy them. They buy several every week. It's like just buy the whole year. It's much cheaper. But um, you could get those off my website. And my first two books are still relevant. If you want those, uh, check my website for that. And what else is going on? I think that's it. I think everybody here, obviously, by now should know that I have a trading service. Okay? All right. I'm going to hop out to the charts, and you guys can start asking about individual issues now. Let's take a look at the overall market first. Okay, let's take a look at the micro, and let's work our way out. And um, I see we have the 50. Let's take the 50 out. Okay. Now, again, we just talked about this V-shaped recovery, so I don't want to beat the dead horse too much on that. But my problem, I'm going to do it anyway, right? My problem is that it's very hard to mount that new leg on top of the old leg. But stranger things have happened. But let things shake out. The market could stabilize in here. Somebody once said years ago, uh, sometimes a market can walk off an overbought condition, okay? So if the market runs up and then does kind of like this, and this starts meandering, and before you know it, you got a base up here, then, of course, you could launch off of that base. One day at a time, though, um, you never know. Sometimes the markets just go straight up in here and then correct, and then we'll, get on, get, we'll hop on in that correction. Uh, but that's why you don't want to get caught up in a one-day pattern, even though it seems like the sky is falling. Speaking of the sky is falling, it might be time to update my Chicken Little report. 
See, Chicken Littles came in around here and claimed that it was the end of the world and the market began to drop. They were like, I told you so. And then two weeks later, the market is back to brand new highs. And that's why you're not going to see me come in and flip that bull bear switch and say, oh, it's a bear or it's a bull. Um, but if we get into downtrend, I'll say, well, we're in a downtrend. I'm starting to look and smell like a bear and feel like a bear. But you're not going to see me make a, a, a short-term prediction uh, or I should say a long-term prediction based on just a few bars on the chart. Okay? Do I do this every week? Uh, Tono, yeah, absolutely, every week. Unless, of course, I have something uh, going on in my business of private life, but for the most uh, cases. Are most of your picks from Phoenix stocks? No, no, no. Uh, Gary, what happens with my methodology is, uh, and this is something I was preaching in the stock webinar. We did the, we did a follow-up webinar a couple weeks. and was talking about this, uh, well, last Friday, in fact. You want your pattern to equal what's going on in the overall market. Well, in the case of gold stocks, well, gold stocks can trade a little contra to the overall market. So the stocks that I like there were like the overall sector. And take a look at like GDXJ, the gold miner juniors, okay, which is was on my Landry list. We talked about that one last week, okay, which, by the way, is in the process of uh, – if it had a little bit more knockout, I'd like it as a setup. I was going to tease you with this one, but I'll show it to you. Um, so the overall sector, you can see, it's kind of bottomed out. It here has begun to rally, kind of made a cup and handle, also made a bow tie. You see the bow tie in here? So that's why you're seeing these gold stocks in here that are bow ties off of these major lows and in uh, so-called Phoenix stocks, what I call Phoenix stocks, and that's why you're seeing those. But no, um, not necessary. I mean, take a look at like RLYP. Uh, this is just a generic pullback at an IPO, okay? Uh, ran up nicely, pulled back, and then took off, pulled back, took off, and then hopefully rinse and repeat. So that's not a Phoenix stock. That's just a momentum stock. TAN was just a momentum stock in here, okay? Uh, you got to go way back in here to find it. But it was a momentum stock way back here as a trend knockout. So it all depends what's going on in the overall market. If this market begins to roll over, we're going to see a bunch of bow ties. We're going to see a bunch of um, gatekeepers and, and other patterns, other transitional patterns off of those uh, new highs. Okay, let's take a look at the Nasdaq. Uh, get this out of the system real quick. Uh, up slightly today, obviously, just shy of multi-year highs. We did have that one down day yesterday. Um, a mama dropped her baby pattern, I think, or or, or the baby pooped his diaper, whatever happened yesterday. But so far today, we're bouncing back. Again, though, market remains oversold. I'm sorry, overbought. Dangerous to trade. A couple of areas doing okay in here. The REITs are doing okay. I'm just having a hard time getting excited about REITs. Drugs are banging on new highs. Biotech looking okay. Uh, some areas, though, uh, like the overall market, as you would imagine, like health services, have made, these, have made he tried to say, these V-shaped recoveries at high levels. And then one other thing that's a little concerning is some areas – stalled well short of their prior highs, sort of like a gatekeeper type of pattern. A gatekeeper is when you have a market that sells off and makes a sharp retracement back up and then stalls out. Now, this is a two-day chart, so it's a two-day gatekeeper on the manufacturing, so that's a little bit um, concerning. But, hey, let's just take things one day at a time. And a couple of the areas like chemicals, V-shaped recovery high levels, and then banks have uh, pulled back but stalled short of their prior highs. And, again, Let's look at like a two-day chart, kind of gatekeeper looking, kind of inverted uh, cup and handle looking, whatever you want to call it, but certainly it's still looking like a top there. What else is happening? I think that's it. Let's just take a look at gold and silver real quick, and then we're going to hop out to your individual stock questions. We should have plenty enough time if I can keep the dew flowing here. All right, where's gold? There it is. Okay. Now, gold, again, this is gold sector overall. I just use GDXJ as a proxy, but you can look at the gold stocks overall. Notice they're coming off of multi, multi, multi-year lows, okay? They're beginning to rally. Now, instead of buying a stock that's way up here and pulling back, I'm more excited about buying these early trend or these Phoenix stocks in the golds, okay? And that's why you're seeing quite a few of those in the portfolio because that's what's going on uh, with this sector. So gold looking pretty good. So far, a little pullback. It's not going to be a straight shot up, and I told my peeps a couple nights ago in the service, it's probably a good thing because if gold just went straight up or any market goes straight up, it's going to likely come straight back down. 
but if it goes, if it if it uh, backs and fills along the way, it'll shake out a lot of nervous Nellies along the way, and it could set up for a longer term trend. So I I'm okay with a trend that doesn't go in just one direction as long as for the most part it works its way higher. Uh, silver, the commodity, did really well in here a couple days ago. Uh, you can see it's begun to break out in earnest. It was sort of lagging gold in, until a few days ago, and this is why we focus mostly on the gold stocks versus the silver ones. But you can see silver, the commodity, has now taken off, and it's coming off of fairly major lows in here, and it's making all those little patterns, all those little transitional patterns, bow ties, et cetera. So bullish on silver, the commodity, bullish on gold, the commodity, Notice your bow tie here off of multi-year lows, and then bullish on the gold, and now bullish on the silver stocks. So overall market still a little mixed. I'm not too excited about going after new biotechnology or any other technology that's at high levels at this juncture. I'd like to see the overall market confirm what's going on. But as I've said quite often, if you really, really like a setup, then by all means, take it. And if I really, really like a setup, then I'll take it. I don't want to you know, three days from now, there's going to be a biotech that looks phenomenal, and I'm going to take it, and, and you guys will be like, but Dave, I thought you said you don't want to buy a biotech. Well, as a general statement, I don't want to rush out and buy it overall, but if something sets up and I really, really like it, knowing that the overall market's overbought, knowing that the sector's overbought, and knowing that I'm going into a dangerous trade, all those caveats going in, then I make the decision on whether or not I want to go with it. And the bottom line is, if it looks really good, then... I'll take it regardless of what's going on everywhere else, okay? Don's here, and he would like to know about F. And F looks like it's still in trouble. Let's get a blank chart in here. Yeah, it's just pulled back a few days. Yeah, I mean, that looks like the mother of all tops in F. Uh, I wouldn't rush out and short it. It's a big, thick stock. It doesn't move around a tremendous amount. Um, but, yeah, it's still in trouble, Don. Sorry about that. Oh, I see. Bow tie off of all-time lows trending up nicely. Rick, or I see. Is that uh Oh, yeah. Okay. I thought it might have been something else. A uh, little bit on the thin side, but I hear you. You got a, you certainly got a bow tie off of all-time lows. You had a nice little knockout move here. Uh, maybe now you're on trend resumption move, so maybe on a little bit deeper uh, pullback. Uh, but, yeah, it certainly looks like a bottom, but a very, very, very thin stock. Look at that, 190,000 shares on average volume over 30 days and it's less than two dollars a share so be really careful in that west for andrea andrea oops did i say that right oh it's not coming up west it's not coming up fst fst uh no I mean, if possible, short, if anything, but uh, draw your arrow, and I'll draw one for you. Okay. How much correction on data before consider? You mean DATA? Oh, I don't know. Um, you know, at this juncture, I'm not as excited about these stocks that are way up here as I am some of the lower ones. I, you know, I don't like this gap here, so I probably wouldn't take it. It's just a little too extreme on the gap. Um, I'd almost like to see it make new highs and then pull back on that one. FST, not a first thrust. FST, not a first thrust. No. No, because first thrust, you talk about it. first thrust would be right here, somewhere in here maybe, or bow tie at least right there. Uh, first thrust would be off the lows. No, it's just it's just kind of crawling off its lows in here. And then, even if it was, you've got all this overhead uh, resistance. GSS, GSS. Um, that's okay. It's a it's a penny stock, so you got to be careful. Not that I wouldn't go after a penny stock sometime. I'm going to give that a not bad. And the reason I'm going to give it a not bad, if it's any other stock, I'd probably say, no, it's kind of choppy, but it is a commodity-related stock, so it can be a little kind of wild and crazy. Um, speculative is all get out, but it, uh, it doesn't have much resistance until you get pretty much way back here, way up here. 
I'm not going to worry about this way back here so much. So, yeah, I mean, that stock could uh, easily double or triple in value before hitting trouble. Uh, but, yeah, get ready for a wild ride. I mean, look at the HV. It's got HV of 100, okay, and it moves around. You know, somebody was asking me about volatility earlier. Look, that's, 10, that's a 10% day, 10%, 9%, 10%, 9%. What's this day right here? 26%. I mean, come on, guys. I mean, this thing's all over the place. So if you traded it, you better use a wide, wide, wide stop. Cray for Robert. Be fun if everybody said where they are. We got Robert in Indiana. <laughs> uh, no, I don't like these one bar melt ups. It's just, just uh, relative to the volatility of the stock. You just had this huge one up bar. A lot of times they'll come right back in, kind of similar to the bottle rocket theory I was talking about. Although it did have a big up bar here, but notice it just kind of meandered lower for months afterwards. Um, you know, this might be one of those stocks that trades in chunks and it just doesn't necessarily fit the um, methodology. It happens. Uh, I think that one's on my Landry list, so uh, good job on that one, Andrea. Uh, FMI, it's gold stock. The uh, one that was on Landry list, at least. Uh, no, there's not much to do here. Uh, this stock would have to break out to new highs and then pull back before getting uh, excited. Q for win. Hmm. Well, it's a biotech. Uh, maybe on a pullback. We'll have to see. I'd almost like to see it clear these prior highs in here more decisively, but maybe on a pullback. Okay, Pack W triggered. Yeah, yeah. Pack W has been in my land list for a while. It's going to be a bank, um, and you can see that I've already got a drawing in here. It's a bow tie pullback, and it triggered. So uh, too late on that one. But yeah, if you if you're short, con congratulations. Dave, your thoughts on the transports? Yeah, transports I didn't talk about a second ago. Let me take a look at the uh, TC group first. One thing I don't like about the transports is they retrace back to the old highs and kind of stalled out, and that kind of gives you that gatekeeper type of appearance or stalling, and whatever you want to call it, head and shoulders, gatekeeper. But you're only a few days away from brand new highs, and you want to look at a DJ20, is that it? DJ20? Uh, yeah, same sort of actually going on there too. Um, it kind of jumps out at me as a non-specific topping pattern, uh, maybe kind of uh, head and shoulder-ish. Or even if you didn't know anything, you could say, well, it's still sort of a bow tie in here. But a few big updates would make all the difference in the world, okay? Like I say, with these transitional patterns, you got to be careful because you're getting into a new trend early, and I, I call them pioneer patterns sometimes because like the American pioneers, you're either going to get the gold or you're going to get an arrow in your back. RSPP, RSPP, RSPP. Uh, that's pretty interesting, but uh, wait for a pullback. Yeah, absolutely. Put that on your radar. Wait for a pullback. AU, sloppy bow tie off all-time lows, trending higher. Sloppy Joe, sloppy Joe. Uh, I wouldn't call it sloppy. Hell no. Yeah, it looks good. Uh, next pullback on that one. But see, now that you've got these big runs in here, now you need a little bit more of a pullback before you look to play them, whereas before we were looking for uh, small ones. I'm long, quick. Fundamentals finally kicking in, and chart looks great. Q-U-I-K. Okay. You could wait a long time for fundamentals. Uh, yeah, it looks okay. Um, if you're long, stay long. It's making boxes. That's always a good thing, a box on top of another box. But... Um, there's no setup there. I would have to really clear this prior base before I would get excited about it. Wix for win. Uh, no, it has to make a new high. If you're long, stay long. I think this one was one from the uh, stock webinar we picked. Or well, certainly there afterwards. Might have been back here. Uh, you long, stay long. Uh, this might be. It might just be building a box in here, but wait for the next leg higher. You see how I've got these little legs drawn in here? Wait for that next leg higher. KRE is a short. Yeah, it's going to be banks overall, right? KRE. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, you can see they look just like the overall sector. Uh, too late, though, on the short because they've already triggered. But, yeah, back to chart way out. And they sure look like they're in a lot of trouble. But could be a little bit of a pioneer trade. ARCP. ARCP. 
Uh, no, because you're not coming off of all-time lows. I can't point it out to you because it's already in my landry list. But there's a there's a there's a uh, a real estate company coming off of all-time lows that looks really good. It's been trending nicely. So no, uh, I'd find something in a better trend in, in real estate. I'm just not that excited about real estate. Okay. TMKR. Uh, I deleted the question about the transports. If you didn't, if you want to re-ask it, um, I, I don't know what the question was. The question, am I worried about the transports? Well, they look like they're in trouble. Um, I'm not a big Dow theorist. Dow theorists are very concerned about the transports, but it, it, it does become one piece of the puzzle. So if the transports begin to slide, then that definitely goes in my negative columns as things I don't like about the market. But I'm not going to time the overall market based on that. Whoever asked about TKMR, it looks fantastic. Wait for a pullback. Obviously, it's trending. That goes in your momentum list. Okay. Dave, I added bow ties of a chart. Seems like they form a lot. I know it's more relevant when it happens at extremes, but do you notice it can reappear multiple times in a short time frame? Yeah, they can, and that's why I like them. Uh, you know, I see bloggers, I don't want to say all the time, but I see bloggers sometimes talk about bow ties, and I'm flattered. They, they forget to mention my name, but that's okay. But I'm flattered, but they mostly talk about them like, for instance, just we just have this stock in here. They'll talk about them like in here, and they're meaningless when they're like just stocks in a range. But if it's coming off of all-time lows or multi-year lows like right there, then it's meaningful, okay? So, yeah, don't look at them unless the market's at all-time lows or whatever, okay? Is a gatekeeper with overhead supply a better signal than one with just new highs? Uh, I'm going to probably say probably. Let's see what GME was. No, GME really wasn't. Yeah, I, I hear you. Probably. Uh, if, if Let's say you had this base up here, and then you have a gatekeeper. Um, probably. Uh, but, you know, I'm going to talk out of both sides of my mouth. Sometimes you might have a stock that's going straight up does this and then it makes the gatekeeper and there's so many people that are that are on the wrong side of the market it begins to implode um, but I, I wouldn't I would I would trade both I, I don't think I would see GPL yeah I think uh, I'm actually long that stock uh, just full disclosure you should buy as much as you can afford <laughs> Dave that's kind of a crazy stock what are you doing now well, these golds I, I kind of tinker around a little bit every now and then uh, yeah, a bit of a knockout move yesterday. I'd like to see even more of a knockout move. But, um, yeah, I think that's one worth putting on your radar. Absolutely. Good uh, good eye. Dave, you're a great mentor and teacher. Thank you. Robin wants to know about NLY. That's going to be a – is that a REIT? Yes, it's a REIT. Uh, it looks okay. No, no, you just get too much overhead resistance. No, scratch that. Okay. Um, go look for some gold stocks or GPL. GPL. You need to buy all you can afford. Let me subliminally say that. GPL. <laughs> uh, Don wants to know about TSL. TSL is in trouble, but it's not coming off all time highs. For the most part, it's electrocardiogram. You want to short something, find something coming off all time highs at this juncture. Short exposure on MA. Uh, that's one. I think many of Fortune sometimes have lost shorting this uh, MasterCard. Uh, I hear you, though. This set up a while back, uh, back here, and kind of gap lower. Uh, I think I would pass and leave it alone, but I hear you. It's definitely a stock that looks like it's in a lot of trouble. Uh, all right. O-H-R-P. O-H-R-P. Sherry's left. Okay. Sherry's left the building. Oh, HRP. Oh, yeah. She left a while back. I thought somebody just left. I, I was going to say, let's talk about them. Uh, yeah, it's kind of interesting. That's kind of the mother of all knockout moods. It's a little bit too extreme. Uh, I hear you, though. Uh, maybe if this knockout wasn't quite so big. I mean, that's like a 50% down bar. And it's also really, really thin. Um, I hear you, though. It's recovered from that big slide. It's just too crazy. I would leave it alone. But I hear you. Man is a short trade. Uh, yeah, it's already triggered, though. This one has been in the list for a while. Thrust down, pull back. Yeah, absolutely. Hog is a short trade. I haven't seen that one. Hog. 
Yeah, it looks okay. It's a super big, thick stock. Um, it's just not going to move enough to make it worth trading. I hear what you're saying. Yeah, BA is a short. Yeah, BA is a short, absolutely. Um, it's getting too many days at the pullback, though. In fact, I took BA off my list yesterday. But I hear you. Um, Sharon was asking about this one a couple of um, weeks ago. You in here, Sharon? Say hello uh, if you are. If not, uh, I'll see you, I guess, next Friday. Um, gap down, thrust, pullback. It's in a lot of trouble, but it's got a lot of support down here around 100, 110. I guess it would be a good problem to have. I just prefer to trade something not so thick. SPWR is a long. We are long this. Um, no, not at this juncture. It's going to have to break out to new highs. Okay. If you're long, stay long. There you go. Thank you, Sharon. I appreciate it. <laughs> Sorry that we got a little PG-13 earlier. <laughs> USO for Frenchie. How you been, Frenchie? Um, USO is, is oil. It's kind of choppy, but it's certainly working its way higher as of late. Okay. Um, you know, here's one. you got to really back the chart out on this one, maybe a couple of years. Let's take a look at the monthly chart. Uh, when it breaks out, it's going to be unbelievable, okay? But shorter term, it's just kind of choppy. Shorter term uptrend, yeah, I wouldn't rush out and buy it. But I'm telling you, look at this trend. Uh, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14. I sound like uh reminds me of um, Godfather. Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday. <laughs> Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Friday. Um, yeah, not now. Shorter term uptrend, yes, but not a setup. But boy, let me tell you something. You might be able to just blindly buy it at 39.50. When it hits 39.50, it's going to 100. Okay, write that down. Okay. Great show. Back to work. We'll be signing up for stock selection webinar service. I'm sold. Haha. <laughs> Thank you, Darius. I appreciate that. Arsity wants to know about I L M mean. I L I L M N. Uh, yeah, on a pullback, absolutely, it's trending. Good eye. G W P H. G W P H. Uh, yeah, it looks fantastic. Yeah, I'll give you a high five on that one. A little bit on the thin side, but it is sixty bucks a share. Uh, I don't like the way it pulled back all the way to here, but you know what? I don't want to pick it apart too much. I think it looks pretty good. So I think that was when when you get a high five. First high five of the day. Okay. Approval is a positive account. Balance. Thank you, Howard. Okay, who else has left the building? MTDR. MTDR. Uh, yeah, but it's, let it break out. Uh, let it break out and then maybe pullbacks along the way. I haven't seen a whole lot of energy setting up just yet, so I'd like to see uh, what else is going on. Be nice about my F. <laughs> DNDN DN for Gary. Poor Gary, been wait he's been waiting an hour for this. Um, no, it's got to break out. It's got to get past um, these low levels. And then the other thing I don't like is it, you got these big gap downs in here. And then you have overhead resistance. I mean, this thing would have to base for a year or two to get rid of all these bad memories. So I leave that one alone. But thanks for um, thanks for waiting, Gary. Appreciate that. Has it gone up too much already? LG and D, LG and D. Lightning round for the next two minutes. Um, you know what it has done? It has gone up too far, too much over a short period of time, based on the volatility of the stock. If you're long, stay long. It looks okay. Uh, maybe a little slight deeper pullback. It looks okay. But I would probably take it off the screen because it jumped up too much too fast. MNKD, too much of a good thing. MNKD, MNKD, MNKD. No. No, it's just in a range. It's going sideways. SMNX is a long trade. It's gone up too much already. Did we talk about that one? SNMX. Yeah, we just talked about that one. Uh, maybe not. Yeah, it looks okay. Uh, has it gone up too much? It's possible. I mean, that's one thing we talked about in the stock selection webinar is that, okay, it's up five. The stock is already up 500%. If you're long, enjoy the ride, but it might be a little late to get in because it's already gone up 500% in about a year. Um, I don't know. It'd have to 
I'd have to really be excited about a setup to buy it after it went up 5% in one year. But, hey, stranger things have happened. Now, that doesn't mean that I won't put this in a momentum list just to track it. Um, a little bit on the thin side, but not too thin. So SUPN, too many days of the pullback. If you're asking, it probably is. SUPN. Um, like my father-in-law used to tell my wife when she was a child. If you're asking, if you're asking if it's good enough, it's probably not good enough. Okay, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Too many days. RBY, that's going to be a gold stock. Uh, no, I don't like the gap down. Okay. Uh, no, not with the gap down. It's going to have to fill that gap. I don't like that at all. BDSI. Uh, too wide and loose. Yeah, yeah, one big gap up day. We talked about that one last week, I think. ALXN is trending. ALXN. Yeah, it's going to need a little bit more knockout move. The only problem here is it might be priced for perfection. And by that, it's like, okay, this stock was way down at low, low, low. I mean, it's up a 1,000% or whatever from where it was a few years ago. So when this stock falls, it's going to it's gonna fall like a rock, drop like a rock. Okay. ZL, TQ, TQ. Um, yeah, too many days in the pullback, and it really had, so it's going to have to, Break out the new highs before I get excited about that one, John. Uh, BDSI, did we do that one? Okay, we're right at, yeah, we did that one. Uh, TSO. Yeah, TSO looks like it's in trouble. Well, yeah, shorter term, though. Yeah, we talked about this, but it's wide and loose. I'd find something coming off of all-time uh, highs and then look to short. Well, look, uh, we're out of time. Jeez. Uh, I'm humbled by your appearance. Uh, I can't believe you guys can listen to me, but please keep coming. <laughs> Thanks for uh, showing up. Um, I have a blast doing these shows, as you can tell. So, uh, but I, without you, there is no show. So I appreciate you coming in uh, to these shows. If we don't talk between now and then, everybody have a fantastic weekend. Um, I'll be out of pocket a little bit tomorrow, so it'll be hard to get in touch with me. But uh, shoot me an email if you need to get in touch with me between now and next show. If not, I'll see you uh, next show. Thank you so much.